your righteous right hand has brought him here, guided him to this tank, to this moment of obedience. It seems as though, Lord, that here at Revolution in the last couple days, I don't know, it's just been this outpouring of your love to your people. Would you touch his heart in a special way now? That he would feel your love flow through his heart, through his being, in a special way, like he's never felt before. Something that solidifies his relationship with you. A deep love, a deep healing of the wounds that he's experienced physically, emotionally, and spiritually. We ask, Father, that your love would heal those wounds now. Help him be a good Christian husband, a good Christian father, a good Christian brother, and use him. Use him to make your plea to the people around him, wherever you may take him. Help him to remember this moment. In Jesus' name. Rick, who is your one and only Lord and Savior? Based on that confession, I now bury you with Christ, and like him, you'll be raised to new life because you trusted in the mighty power of God that raised Christ from the dead. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's, a, uh, there's this myth in the church that when someone's to be baptized, you go find the pastor, right? Well, that's not really true. See, the Bible, it's very clear in, in the Great Commission, Jesus is speaking to his disciples, which if you've said yes to Jesus, you're his disciple, and it's obvious now that Rick is his disciple. <clears throat> and the commission says to go make disciples disciple, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and to teach them all that I have taught you. So I'm going to step aside and let this disciple of Christ do what he's been called to do. You guys know Pete. Do you want to share anything, brother? Do you want to share anything? You can if you want. Lord, I think about Jeremiah right now. You, told, you, you said to him that before he was even born, you decided he was going to be your mouthpiece to the nations. And you decided that for Pete. And he, like all the rest of us, stubborn, stiff-necked people, we have walked away from you, prone to wander, prone to leave the Lord we love. But today he has returned. And Lord, I pray that you make him a new man. You give him a new heart and offer him a new start. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray a stronger anointing on him than he's ever had before. Whatever influence he's ever had in this world for you, Lord, I pray you'll multiply it. And you bless him, and you bless him and his wife, and you bless him and his children. 
Let him leave a long legacy of good and of love long after his days here on earth are over. Thank you in Jesus' name, who is your one and only forever Lord and Savior. Jesus! Jesus. Based on that confession, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Come on. Pray for this man. Pray for this man. Awesome. Everyone good? I think we should shout out to Jesus. Hmm. That's what I was thinking, Frank. Yeah. That's it, man. That's what I'm thinking. Oh, my goodness gracious. I'm running out of room up here. Put it over here. Hey, Mark, don't forget your watch up here, brother. It's kind of blending in with the carpet. Why don't you all do me a favor and uh, grab a Bible and open it up to Joshua chapter 22. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, there's orange and yellow ones scattered around the building. You can grab one. Uh, many of the verses that we share uh, this evening will be up on the screen for those Bibles. Not your Bible. You've got your own Bible and you know how to get to... And we can uh, see the page number up there. Now, I'm not going to give you the verse up there. I'm just going to give you the Scripture reference so you can look it up yourself. Really, our hope in that is, uh, is that if you'll feel comfortable reading your Bible here, then hopefully you'll, be f- you'll feel more comfortable reading it at home. And so we're not going to spoon feed you. We want you to dig stuff out on your own. And as a matter of fact, I just want to say that not only do we want you to read it when we're here, but I really want you to go home And I want you to take some notes. I'd want you to take notes and then go home and check everything that comes out of my mouth with that book. That's that's a a wise person will do that. Okay? Don't just assume because I have a microphone and a college degree that I know what in the world I'm talking about. You gotta make your own decision. So um, anyway, while you're turning there to Joshua chapter 22, um, does anyone anyone like a computer person out there? Anyone? And and this is not so that you can take my computer and fix it. I'm, I'm not trying to like get you to do something. I'm not trying to manipulate the situation. Who's a computer person? Like pretty savvy, right? Well, I'm not. And um, this, uh, this week, I don't know what's going on with my little laptop there on, the, on, the, on, the, on my desk, but it's got like a, an issue. I don't know what's going on with it. Is the air conditioning on in here? No. Just got turned on? Nice, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, This is what it feels like if you don't accept Jesus as Savior. Just a little, just a little clue in. It's a prop. It was a sermon prop. We did it intentionally, kind of. Yeah. So, uh, so anyway, so I got this computer and it's 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 freezing up and stuff like that, and so. Uh, I was told that you, you should defragment your, the computer. Does anyone ever hear of that? Defrag the computer? I don't know anything about computers really, but from what I understand, the defrag, when you, when you analyze, the, the, you click on this thing on the control panel and it, and, it, and it shows like with these little colors and a smart person would know what that means. And in these colors, there's like blue and there's red and green and everything's supposed to kind of be in order. Like, the stuff that's not where it's supposed to be is like red and it's mixed in with the blue stuff. And so what happens is it jacks up the whole computer because it doesn't know how to function properly because it's trying to get through these files that are not in order. And so you click analyze and you click defrag and it, and it I don't know what it does, you know, Microsoft, Apple things, and it makes things in order and it refiles everything in order so that it runs right and it runs smooth. Do you, are you guys tracking with me? You know what I'm talking about? Okay, so um, I, I did that, and it, it was a great way to start off a sermon, but it didn't work. So anyone who raised their hand, now I got you. If you want to fix my computer, you can. Um, in Joshua 22, it's funny because I, as I was thinking about the, the, this, this text to discuss with you this week, uh, that story of, of the defragging of my computer was appropriate. Because in this text in Joshua 22, 
you're gonna, we're going to take a look at, at two huge problems, both back then and here and now, that sort of hijack our spiritual hard drive, and it helps, and, and what happens is we don't function properly because these things get in the way, and you'll see that in the text. Uh, what you're going to see is um, just the very next paragraph, which is where we left off last week, and it's really neat because what's happening in these people's lives is very much like our lives. They, they, they conquer, they win, there's victory, and then in the very next sentence, just wham, here comes something else again, right? Anyone relate to that? So, so the Bible is very apropos for this day because it's the same thing back then as it is now. So we're going to talk about these two huge problems. And let me just say, uh, to start out with, that I believe that there's a, a wholesale complacency toward God. There's a wholesale complacency toward God. And, and I believe that this cancer has not only affected our great nation, but on a greater scale, at a, at a higher level, uh, the church universally. Across the whole world, there's a, there's a, a, a horrible complacency toward God. Uh, there's a tendency, as the, the writer of Hebrews tells us in, in chapter 10, uh, there's a tendency in us back then and, and then also now to, to, to treat the gospel as common, like it's not a big deal. You know what I'm saying? Like, and I think, uh, you know, let me just say this, and, and this is just me, it's not like the Bible or anything, but this is just my opinion. Um, and and you, can, you can shun me if you want, but, you know, the Bible says we're supposed to, 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 to walk by faith and not by sight. But I think it's because, I think we treat it as common even more so as time goes on. Because it was 2,000 years ago that all this insane, amazing stuff happened there on the cross at Calvary. And, like, we're not there to see it. We don't, I guess what I'm saying is we don't understand the magnitude of what happened on the cross. And I think that's why we, and I think that's why I treat it as common sometimes, like it's no big deal. God, I'll get to you when I get to you. Like, God, you understand how I am. I'm made this way. It's okay. Kind of lax with our own sin. We don't understand that it's our sin. And if you think about it, just the sin that you committed today, one of you. Now, now, now take that one day, like today's sin, right? And add yesterday's. And the day before, and keep going till the moment you were alive, and you do the same. And you, can you? And this is what happened on the cross at Calvary. So you, 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 when you start to do that, and, and later when we take communion, I'm going to kind of lead you down that road. I want you to be thinking when we talk about announcing the Lord's death, like to be thinking of the magnitude of what happened on the cross when he absorbed the wrath of Almighty God because of every sin ever committed, including yours. When you understand and you wrap your brain around that magnitude, maybe we won't treat the gospel as common, like it's no big deal. We have a propensity as humans to kind of tuck Jesus into the nooks and crannies of our life. We do that often. Uh, we only come to him, and this one just, I don't understand it, when all else fails. Well, what are you going to do now? Well, I guess it's, it's all that's left to do now is pray. Right? Yeah, I mean, everyone's laughing because they've all said it. Well, I guess I'll just pray now. Like, that's the last thing you should do. Like, if Pete can't help me, well, then I'll pray. If Mark or Beth can't help, like if you can't get it done, then I'll ask God. You know, it's like that, that's the mentality that we have. We, we only go to him when all else fails. Or at very best, we'll give him, you know, Sunday. This is a rebel, a rebel church. We do it on Saturday. But, you know, we'll, we'll give him uh, Sunday morning from 10 to 11. That's when we'll give God. We'll tuck him into that nook and cranny. But certainly that is not the biblical model for Christ following. And I want to kind of unpack what the biblical model is for you so we can adjust our life according to what God's Word says about us and about Him. That's when we said, here's my heart, Lord. Speak what is true. We want to hear the Word of God. And I'm just a crazy enough pastor to believe as I look out over, these, over your faces, all of these people, the, all that I know you all, I believe you're crazy enough to actually lay down your life and go, you know what, I'm going to do what this book says. Open it, read it, do it, right? Open it, read it, do it. Open it, read it, do it. Okay, let me start here. There's a famous uh, preacher back in the early 1900s. His name was A.W. Tozer. He said something. I love this. This is awesome. He said, what comes to our minds when we think about God is the single most important thing about us. 
That was a good amen spot. I'm going to read it again. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Amen. Now, I would offer you, I, I, I wouldn't dare, I'm, not, I'm no A.W. Tozer by any means, but I'll offer this Moses Robbins little caveat to the end of it, and I would tell you that, that this decision on who God is to you is the single most important decision of your life. Like, there's, there's no other decision that you'll ever make that you're even going to be thinking about 100 years from now, 200 years from now, 1,000 years from now. You're not going to be going, you know what? When we left church that night, I knew we should have gone to Cracker Barrel. I just knew it. I just, I don't know why Moses wore those shoes, man. I just, I should have wore the black ones. Like, no decision, no decision you will ever make is more important than the decision that you make on who God is. Here, here, let me give you some truth. The reason why I want to give you this truth is because God is, this, I don't even know how, I don't have a better way to say it because I'm not an articulate man. God's important. God's important, right? Let me give you some truth. The truth is found in Acts 17, verse 28. This is what it says. For in him, God, for in God we live and move and exist. Now, I love, I love that, this is just a side note too, I, I love how he says live and exist. Because most of us use those words synonymously, don't we? Well, they're, they're not the same. They're not the same at all. See, if without God, if he didn't breathe life into you, you could say, well, I'd just be a worthless blob of jello, right? And you'd all be wrong. <laughs> I got you you wouldn't be anything. You, you wouldn't exist. You, your very existence is because of God. Without him, you, we, you're not even here, right? So that's the first step. That's, like, that's the shallow end of the pool. Well, we step in a little bit deeper and we talk about what Jesus said. He said, I came that you might have life and live it abundantly. See, there's a difference between just existing, just walking through life, oh, just whatever the wind blows, you know, do whatever. There's a difference between that and living with vitality and the adrenaline rush and the adventure and the journey of life. Feelings and emotions, crying, screaming, yelling, happy, sad, that's living. And without God, you can't feel it. We not talk much about move. But without him giving you the ability to think and make decisions, go, move, do, who can do that on their own? Who else in all of the universe provides this for you? To live and move and exist. It's in God. It's in God. So we can say that he's really, really important. See, that's the truth. In him we live and move and exist. But the sad reality is, we find this in Romans chapter 1, verse 18, and then of course 21 through 25. I'll summarize it this way. And you can check out that, that verse if, if you'd like. But this is what it basically says. It says, they, you, me, don't worship him as God. But instead, verse 25, we worship the things God created rather than the creator himself. That's what we do. See, it's in him that we live and move and exist, but yet we don't worship him like that. We treat him as common. We tuck him into the nooks and crannies of our life like he's not that important. But it's in him that we live and move and exist. But what we do is we worship other things. It's our perspective that's crooked. It's his position in our life that is threatened. And that's what we talk about. Last week I shared something with you. I'm going to repeat it again. I'll tell you that Jesus Christ has no identity crisis. You know, it doesn't make any difference. Uh, I'm reading a, I just read a book and my wife's reading a book right now. If you, if you have a chance, read it. It's called Keep Your Love On. And this book talks about being a powerful person versus a powerless person. A powerful person makes a decision, and it doesn't matter what you do. If I'm going to love you, I don't care if you, if you take a hammer to my face, I'm going to love you. Like, you can't take that power from me. If I want to love you, who cares what you say? I'm going to love you anyway. That's a powerful person. A powerless person goes, I'm going to love you. And then you go, you're a jerk, and you go, I don't love you anymore. That's powerless. You know what I just did? I transferred my power to him. And Jesus Christ is the most powerful person who ever lived, and I'll tell you why. It doesn't matter what you think of him. 
He is eternal king. There's nothing that anyone can do about it. He is the everlasting, eternal king of the universe. He has no identity crisis at all. He doesn't need to go find himself. Jesus Christ never has to go find himself. He knows exactly who he is. He's not going to leave his bride and go buy a Corvette. That's just not what Jesus is going to do. He will never leave his bride. Never. No matter what we do to him, he will never leave us. Because why? Because he loves you incredibly. And it doesn't make any difference if you cheat on him. It doesn't make any difference if you spit on him. It doesn't make any difference if you ignore him. He loves you like crazy and he's never going to leave you. That's what he does. That's who he is. And it doesn't make any difference what you do. It's not him that's the problem. It's us. It's you. It's me. I choose it. I slide to it. What is this it that I speak of? Well, our human nature in all of us, we have this tendency to, to consistently slide toward a, a common problem. And, and the, the theological term for it, you know, is, is idolatry. And, and, and not to get all fancy with you, it's just establishing a fake God. Would you agree? We're just establishing a fake We're making something God that isn't. That's it. We're making something God that isn't. And so Romans 1 is the practical definition. If that's the theological term, the practical definition is found there in Romans 1 where I share with you that we worship and serve the created things rather than the creator. That's how it, that's how it works out. That's how it fleshes out in our life. You know there's only two groups of things in this whole universe. There's everything... And then there's God, right? I love in, in, the, in, in the Gospel of John, right, in the first thing it says that everything was created by him that was created. Like everything that, that you could see and not see in the whole universe was created by God. And then over here is God. There's only two things you could choose. So, uh, and I'm not talking about like building a shrine and, and burning candles to little Buddhas to make them your God. Like how many people do that, right? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> right? But, but, but so when you talk about idolatry, people start thinking that like, oh, well, maybe he's got a little shrine to, the, you know, to, to, to Mary or to the Buddha over here or something like that. Like, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about anything else is, is immensely relied upon. Like if you immensely rely upon something that was never created to hold the weight of your reliance, if you, if you weigh down, if you admire something intensely that does not deserve such admiration, do you know, I'm going to pick on some people, do you know that there are people that have a favorite football team, like this is not about you, Mark, I, honest to God, it's not about you. There are people that have a football team, if that football team loses, they're in a cave, the lights are off, they get a bottle of... of, 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 of of booze, like, and they're like sackcloth and ashes, and, and they're mourning and weeping, and if you like look at them wrong, they'll stab you in the throat with a spoon. My team lost! <laughs> Don't talk to me! I mean, I have news for you, right? Tom Brady is not sitting at home on Saturday afternoon with a poster on the wall of Moses going, come on, man, you're going to preach a good message. I know it. people are going to get saved today. Come on, come on. Oh, no one got saved. Oh, Jägermeister. No, he's not doing that. But we are. We are. We, our identity is in our team. It's foolish. We resource things easily. Where's our time going? Where are our thoughts? Where's our money invested into? Things that I just give myself easily to and immensely, constantly, all the time. Well, in the text that we're going to read now, the nation of Israel felt like there were two and a half tribes. You'll read about them. Uh, Reuben, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh. And they thought that these people were actually making that shift toward bad worship, false worship. So let's go there for a second. Let's do a little reading and see what we're talking about here. So the backstory here in Joshua, we've studied through the book of Joshua, but just for those who have not 
been able to be here. You're getting to the show a little bit late, so let me, let me just fill you in. The, the nation of Israel has crossed over the, the Jordan River, and they've conquered all these other people, and God promised this land that we know now as Israel, like that's going to be this land that they're going to live in. It's the promised land. It's the place of rest. They're going to be able to flourish there and, and to worship God freely there and to plant crops and harvest and all that and have a great life. And so they're there, and they've divvied up the land, and they've conquered all these other places. And, and these, th- these two and a half tribes, they were given land before they crossed over, and they were told that you need to go over and help these other tribes secure their spot so they can have rest and peace and joy and prosperity before you can go back and enjoy yours. And so they did that. They were faithful. And so now they've actually gone, they're on their way back to their land. The fighting is pretty much over and they're going to go back and enjoy the blessings that God has given them in this land. And so this is where we pick it up in chapter 22, verse 10. It says, but while they were still in Canaan, these these two and a half tribes, before they moved back to their land, they're still there in Canaan, which is now Israel. And when they came to a place called Geliloth, near the Jordan River, the men of Reuben Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh stopped to build a large and imposing altar. The rest of Israel heard that the people of Reuben Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh I don't know why he always says that. He always says those people over and over again. Uh, he, they had built an altar at Galiloth at the edge of the land of Canaan on the west side of the Jordan River. So the whole community of Israel gathered at Shiloh and prepared to go to war against them. So they were thinking, man, these guys, they, God has been so good to us, and they're now building a new altar over here for themselves. They're going to shift their worship from the one true God to something else. And they're like, man, you can't do that. So they think it's such a big deal. They're going to go to war and kill these people because they had just gone into this land and killed all those other people that weren't worshiping God. And so they're like, well, we got to kill them too. They're not worshiping God. And before they do, they send a delegation of some leaders from the nation of Israel over to find out what's going on. And this is what they said, verse 16, we'll pick it up there. The whole community of the Lord demands to know why you are betraying the God of Israel. How could you turn away from the Lord and build an altar for yourselves in rebellion against him? Now they're going to give their answer down uh, in verse 24, but they weren't doing that actually. They were not in rebellion against the Lord. They were building an altar, but it was not what the nation of Israel thought that it was. And so they clarify here. Verse 24, the truth is, in their response, we have built this altar because we fear that in the future your descendants will say to ours, what right do you have to worship the Lord, the God of Israel? The Lord has placed the Jordan River as a barrier between our people and you people of Reuben and Gad. You have no claim to the Lord, so your descendants may prevent our descendants from worshiping the Lord. So we decided to build the altar, not for burnt offerings or sacrifices, but as a memorial. It will remind our descendants and your descendants that we too have the right to worship the Lord at his sanctuary with our burnt offerings, sacrifices, and peace offerings. Then your descendants will not be able to say to ours, you have no claim to the Lord. So see, they, were, they, they thought that they were building an altar for a certain reason, and you see that they clarified that they weren't building it for that reason, to do anything other than as a memorial, to remind everyone that this is the one true God and we're to worship Him. So they weren't really doing anything wrong. And what I want to say to you, since you're not building altars and you're not building shrines to Buddha and all these types of things, we just talk about, about immensely relying on things, like intensely uh, admiring things, resourcing things easily that shouldn't receive your resources. I guess what I'm saying is that it all depends with this item or this thing or this way. It all depends on your motives. It all depends on its use. It all depends on the intention behind it. So we, but we need to be careful not to slip into what Israel was accusing Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh from doing. That shift. We have, to, we have to guard ourselves from that because we easily slip into that, don't we? See, Proverbs 4.23, I think it is, it says this. 
above all else, guard your heart. Guard your heart. You, you, you have to be vigilant. The Bible says to stay sober-minded. Because if you don't, if you're not aware of the things around you, like research things, meditate on God's word, look stuff up, ask questions, stay protected by your brothers and sisters in Christ because you've got to guard your heart because there's all kinds of stuff invading your heart every single day through your eyes telling you what you should and shouldn't believe in, what you shouldn't worship, what you should worship. But Jesus is Lord and we're to worship him. We have to guard our hearts above all things. Every day, all day long, you're being bombarded with things that you should worship. You need this. You're better with this. This is your identity. This is who you are. If you drive this car, this is what people think of you. If you look this way, this is what people think of you. When all the while, God's like, no, no, no. Let me tell you what, who you are. And let me tell you who I think you are. And we have to guard our hearts. And if you think, well, I'm coming to church. Well, that's good. But listen, above all else, guard your heart. Not just today. Not just for this hour or so, every day. You've got to be on patrol, vigilant, watching the walls of your heart, of the city here, right? You've got to watch it because it's going to be constantly invaded by the world. Above all else, guard our hearts. Let's talk about some of the things that take God's place. Some of us think that, well, you know what, I'm, I'm kind of... Uh, I'm, I'm incomplete now, and, but when I get married, when I have a spouse, then, then I'll have someone I can love and something I can do and someone I can provide for and someone who's going to make me happy. Yeah. I love my wife, but she does not. Look, she makes me happy some days and she makes me sad other days. But there's one who gives me joy every day. Amen. Right? Come on. Right, so that so you can't. My wife, I love my wife, but she she was not created with the with the spine and the and the strength to hold the weight of my joy. She can't do it. And on her best days, she's making me happy. On my best days, I'm making her happy. But my joy and my eternal salvation does, and my identity is not wrapped up in my wife. Amen. I'm a, I'm a Christian first. I'm a husband second, okay? How about our kids? Well, once I have some kids, I'll, I'll be happy. I can't wait to have some children. We're going to have someone to love. We're going to have someone to teach, the, teach them about the Lord and all these great things. We're going to play baseball with them and football with them and all these things. Yeah, okay. How many people have kids? Super happy all the time, right? You ever step on that Lego at night? You're ready to ship them off to summer camp in the middle of December, right? Yeah. It's not going to happen. How about my career, man? As soon as I get this, I remember when I was, I remember when I was a young and I was like, man, if I could just make 150 bucks a week, man, I would be set. <laughs> then I got a job at Movie Land, and they paid me $300 a week. Man, my life, I doubled. How, how's that going to work for me now? Like, if I just get this job, if I just get this position, if I, listen, so how about if I get this job for $250,000 a year? That would be awesome, right? Until the economy bombs and the company goes out of business. Talk about all the people at General Motors that have no more pension after working 40 years. Your career means nothing. It's not intended to, put, to place your identity. Hey, what do you, hey, what's your name? Mark. What do you do? That's what we always ask, right? What do we do? That's who your identity is in this country. What do you do? That marks who you are. It's not who you are. If you've accepted Jesus, you're Jesus' little brother or sister. That's who you are. We put our weight in, the, in our country. We put our weight in our, in our identity and in our purpose and, and our motivations in money. And then a big one here in the States in our hobbies and our sports. Gives us our identity. Go Gators! Yeah. Like Jared's not here. I got to pick on the next row. That's just the way it is. <laughs> See, all these things, they're all good. Every single one of these things that I just said to you, a career, some cash in your pocket, some kids, some friends, a great country, these are all great things. Don't you agree? They're all great things. 
They're all good. They're all things that were created by God and given to you by God so you can thank God for them. I, I believe that with all my heart. But if any of these things get elevated beyond their proper place, then good has transitioned into bad. It's transitioned into bad. The object of my greatest affections, the bulk of my thoughts, the majority of my time, the anchor for my peace and my joy, the elephant in my budget, what is it? What is it? You know, Paul said something, it was awesome, in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, he, he says this, speaking of your greatest affections and what you put your hope in and your identity and all this stuff, because a lot of us call ourselves Christians, but yet we're not worshiping Christ as Savior and Creator and Sustainer and Provider and Lover of our soul. We're not, we're not worshiping Him, we're treating Him as gospel as sort of common. And he says this in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, he said, and he's writing to a church, it's right into a, to a church in Corinth, right? So the, the assumption is that they're believers, right? And he says, examine yourself to see if your faith is genuine. Test yourself. I don't really like this translation. The New American Standard says to, to test to see if you're in the faith. He's writing to people that go to church every week and says, you need to test your affections, test your loyalty, test your focus, test your resources, Test these things to see if you're even actually a Christian. Now, I'm not here to, to scare anybody. I'm just here to proclaim God's word that you might, here's my heart, Lord, speak what is true and, and, and line back up with the word of God so your salvation is sure and your experience is beautiful. There's only one God. His name is Yahweh in Hebrew. He exists in three distinct persons. He's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. All God, all one, unique, exclusive, eternal. And then here's the, second, here's the second thing I want to talk about. He's jealous. And really when I talk about jealous, it's really wrapped up in what we've already been talking about. But if, if at first it was the throne in my heart, then now we're talking about the throne in everybody's heart. Not just where you are with him, but where you are and allowing other people to put him on the throne. Let me explain. Exodus 20, verse 5. In the Ten Commandments, it just says basically this, that I'm jealous. God says I'm jealous. Not like, hey, you got something that I don't have. Man, you got a new car. You got a sweet Jeep, Jimmy. I wish I had a Jeep. Like, God's not going, I want a Jeep. He's jealous of something, though. And he goes on to say what he's jealous of. He says, I won't tolerate anything else being on my throne. I will not tolerate this overwhelming, undue affection that you have for anything other than myself. He won't do it. Let me explain what I'm talking about. Uh, all of nature, I want to explain this right, all of nature, all of creation exists and it runs on God-given instinct and pattern. Okay? Like the planets. I mean, you, go to, you, you remember going to school, remember the, the, the sun and there was all the planets on the little poles with the little, and they were going around and stuff like that. Okay, it's just, it's doing it every day, right? And, and, the, and the earth is on its axis and it's spinning and stuff like that. Like nowhere in that cosmic play is a planet like Pluto going, you know, I've been going this way like a NASCAR driver to the left for like ever. And, you know, I'm just kind of tired of going that way. So I think, you know, I'm just going to go this way now. It, it just doesn't work that way, does it? You know, like, when, let, me, let me say, when, 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 you, when there's a rabbit going, you know, hop, hoppity, hoppity, hoppity through somebody's yard, right? And, and, and they, they're going around, and, and all of a sudden, there's little Bootsy, your cat, right, outside, right? Like, he, he, he listen, the rabbit's not going, uh, hey, Bootsy, you know, I've heard some things about you. I, I, I heard what you did to my 14 brothers. But you kind of look cute and fuzzy. And do you think maybe we could talk about the fact that you want to rip me to shreds? Like, is, is that going, I mean, is, that, is, is a lion going, you know, I, I just, I, I don't like the way I look. And so I think I'm just going to be a vegetarian. Like, does that happen? 
See, everything in creation, all of the universe is running on, on instinct and God patterns, what God instructed it to do except for humans. Except for humans, it's the only thing. We have free will, and so the only throne that God is competing for is you. That's it. It's the only thing he's, he's looking. It's the only thing that's up for grabs is the throne of your life. But see, what happens is, once he finally invades you, I find this to be true in, in, in life, and you can disagree if you want, but I think that once we receive something really awesome, I'm not talking about something that's good. I'm talking about something that's rocking. We don't like to share it with people. See, we're selfish people. Anyone have a good fishing hole? No. Yeah. <laughs> See what I mean? Sinner. Anyone have a, a quiet spot that's real scenic? They just like to get away where it's just quiet. You want to go tell everyone about that? No. It wouldn't be quiet anymore. That's just the way we are. You find something that's really, really good, you don't like to share it. If it's kind of a nice thing, you say, hey, look what I got, look what I got, check this out. If I was a lady and then some man was courting me and he bought me a big diamond and, or whatever, and I, you know, you ladies do that. Hey, look what I got, look what I got. That's common, right? That's what we do. But if all of a sudden you stumbled upon the largest diamond on the planet, would you be walking around on your hand going, hey, check this out? You'd be dead. What would you do? Laser beams? Sharks with laser beams? Right? Yeah. It's mine, 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 oh mine. And I'm not going to share it with anybody. That's the way we are. Anybody have little kids, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I need this toy! If you take this toy, I will poop my pants right now and scream forever. It's like the old busted up toy that nobody wants, you know? Like you get them this brand new, you know, car. And they don't want to drive it, but there's a broken plastic spoon that's been sitting in the, play, in, the, in the box for two and a half years. But the second Jameson holds it, Jackson just smashes his face on the floor and says, I have to have the spoon! Amen. And what's she going to do? She had my hat today, and she was willing to make him ball scream and cry because she wouldn't let him have my hat. I just used it all morning. It was filled with sweat and stink. And she was holding on to that thing like it was the greatest thing she's ever had. And she wouldn't let him have it. That's just the way we are. And I would offer to you that we're the same with God. That we pick and we choose who deserves to get God. And I think it's sad. If you don't think this is true, I would like to refresh your memory. We did a study uh, a long time ago, I guess it was in the old building, called I Am Jonah. Some of you were there for that. Remind you of our friend Jonah, and if you want to go there, you can, but in Jonah, uh, what's happened is, is that he's a prophet of the Jewish people, the Hebrews, and, and, and he's a worshiper of Almighty God. That's the Jewish people, that's their God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God's like, hey, uh, Jonah, I want you to go to that Gentile's a city over there, Nineveh, that, and they don't worship me, and they are so rotten, and they're so terrible, they sin like crazy, they're evil, wicked people, and I want you to go tell them that I'm going to destroy their whole city in 40 days because of their wickedness. And Jonah's like, no, I'm not telling them anything. So we don't know exactly why at the beginning of the story why he didn't want to do it, but he makes it very clear at the end of the book of Jonah why he doesn't want to tell them. So do me a favor, go to Jonah uh, chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3. Read this together. Jonah chapter 3. This is what happens, verse 10. I'll give you a second to get there. Give me a moment to swig some coffee. And this coffee is good tonight. Who made it? Ha <laughs> ha. When God saw, 
Is it? 631? Obadiah, after Obadiah, the book that everyone reads every day. Some of you are like, that's in the Bible? <gasps> anyway, well, listen. That Bible you have may have different page numbers than this because it's a different draft. Um, Jonah chapter 3, so he, he doesn't want to tell them because this is what happens. When God saw what they had done, they had repented, these people. They're like, oh, we're, God's, God's upset. We're doing wrong. So I want everyone to fast. It said that even the animals had to fast. It's kind of crazy, right? Everyone fast and repent and pray and, 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 and turn to God. So they repented and they, were stopped. they weren't wicked anymore. So it says here, when God saw what they had done and how they had put a stop to their evil ways, he changed his mind and did not carry out the destruction he had threatened. And so this is, what he, this is Jonah. This change of plans greatly upset Jonah, and he became very angry. So he complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? That is why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew that you were a merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry and, fi and filled with unfailing love. Well, like that's, if someone ever accuses you of that, just, oh, that's so terrible. All right? You're terrible. You're so nice. You're eager to turn back from destroying people. Just kill me now. <laughs> I'd rather be dead than alive if what I predicted will not happen. The Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry about this? The reason why he didn't want to, he didn't want to tell these people about it, this, this judgment that God, because he knew they were going to repent and God was going to forgive them, and they would, be, they would be his people too. And he'd have to share his God. And he hated those people because they were wicked. They don't deserve God. We do that. We do it all the time. Mine, mine, oh mine. He's my God. I'm a Hebrew. I'm a Hebrew. And you're naughty, misbehaving Gentiles, and you don't deserve to be part of my gang, mine, mine, oh, mine. How about in uh, Acts chapter 10? It's not as hard to find as Jonah. They tore out Jonah? It's just because they read it so much, they wore it out. Acts chapter 10. Let me tell you what's going on here. The good news, the gospel of Jesus had been preached to the Jews and some Jews were receiving it. But all of a sudden, Peter goes to some Gentiles. And this is, this is what it says in Acts chapter 10, verse 34. Then Peter replied, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism in every nation, he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. This is the message of good news for the people of Israel, that there is peace with God through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. So see, what he's saying here, what, what he's saying is that this news has to get to Israel. It's not exclusive, guys. He is, you are not the only ones who can receive this salvation and relationship eternal with God. It's open. He's Lord of all. He's Lord of all. And they didn't think that. They didn't even go around the Jewish people back then. They didn't even go around Gentiles because they were filthy, dirty, terrible people. Let's read on. Verse 42. And he ordered us to preach everywhere and to testify that Jesus is the one appointed by God to be the judge of who? Of all, the living and the dead. He is the one all the prophets testified about, saying that everyone who believes in him will have their sins forgiven through his name. Even as Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening to the message. The Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles as well. So you've got to understand the magnitude of this. They, they thought that he was their God. And God's saying, no, I'm everyone's God. I'm the one true God. I'm the only God. Don't worship anything else, for I am 
jealous. I am jealous. I am Lord of all. And so the same thing is kind of brewing over here in Joshua. As we read it, the same thing is happening over here in Joshua. They think that they're starting to shift their worship to something else, right? And look what it says here. It says that there was a, bo- there was a the Lord, they thought that the Lord had placed a, the Jordan River as a barrier between our people and you people. Like, this is my God. He's our God over here. And so you see the, the, the walls and the barriers that people try to put up to keep people from coming to Christ? I've said it so many times. There's a song. I can't remember who it is. It says, Jesus paid too, far too much a price for us to pick and choose who should come. Every, he is the Lord of all people. He is available to all people. He is the one true God, the Lord of all. They were trying to set standards, these people, for who gets God and who doesn't. But he says that people from every nation, everyone, everywhere, no favoritism. But we do that, guys. See, a lot of us think that someone's too far gone for God to love. Too evil. You don't act like, you don't dress like. I ain't inviting her to my church. That's the last person we need around here. See, the problem with that type of attitude is God's word. God's will. Let me explain to you what God's will is so you understand and you can line your life up with it. Matthew 18, 14, it is not my... Heavenly Father's will that a single lost person should perish. 1 Timothy 2.3, God our Savior wants everyone to be saved. Acts 17.30, that God commands everyone everywhere to repent of their sins and turn to Him. Romans 3.29 and 30, after all, is God the God of the Jews only? Isn't He also the God of the Gentiles? Of course he is. That's what it says. That's not me. There is only one God, and he makes people right with himself only by faith, whether they are Jews or Gentiles. Do you know what Jews and Gentiles means? It's either the people from Israel, the Jews, or everyone else. So unless you're one of those Hebrews, you're a Gentile. And what the Bible is saying is that God is the God of all people, of all people. If God is actually God, then he is due the worship of all people. If God creates and sustains all people, then all people should not have just the should not be obligated to just worship him, but they should be given the opportunity as well. And you and I should never get in the way of that opportunity. As we come to an end here tonight, I want to read something to you because I think that Peter nails it right here. Like I couldn't in a million years come up with this unless Almighty God grabbed my pen and wrote it, which he did right here with Peter. And you see over in Acts chapter 17, I want you to look at, look at it with your own eyes. Acts, 7, uh, Acts 11 verse 17 and 18. See, what happened is the Holy Spirit fell on the Gentiles, too. He was pouring out onto the Gentiles so they could repent and believe and become part of the family. And it says here, verse 17, And since God gave these Gentiles the same gift he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to stand in God's way? Who am I to stand in, what, in God's way. If God wants to grab a hold of the most filthy, rotten, disgusting human you have ever had the, 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 the privilege of, of thinking of or knowing, who are you to get in the way of it? And we need to understand that our roots as a church, no matter how long, it would be 25 years from now, 25 years could go by, and and some of you will come, and some of you will go. Some of you will be dead. Maybe me. But our roots come from that story in the Gospels where Jesus is meeting with all these people, and the religious people come in. And they say, 
Why does your teacher eat with such scum? And Jesus stands up, jumps out of his seat, and says, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I came not to save those who think that they are righteous, but those who know that they are sinners. See, the people that the religious people called scum, the worst people in the world, they don't want to give their God to those people. They don't deserve it. So we all, all of us need to remember the pit that we were in when Jesus reached down and grabbed us. What the religious people called scum, Jesus said, come. And we need to not get in the way of that. We need to guard our hearts, folks, from the slide, from the shift, the common problem of shifting focus and shifting motivations and shifting purpose and dependence and identity. We can't do that. We can't worship anything other than the exclusive one who is capable and worthy to be our all in all. And let us never forget that God made every person in his image to be like him. That he is the Lord of all and he does not want any person to worship anything other than him. He desires to sit on the only throne that is up for grabs in this entire universe and that is the throne of your heart. And so the question I have for you tonight is uh, I'm going to call some men up to hand out our communion. And as you receive these elements, here's the question. Will you, not the person next to you, but will you give him the throne of your heart? 